Oh, I wonder what the time is. Oh, I don't have my watch. Hey, Gary, do you have the time? You want to know the time? Oh, no, sorry. Let me ask Gary. What time is it? Oh, it's four minutes past 12 and 30 seconds. Hey, Gary, Gary says it's four minutes past 12 and 30 seconds. Okay, thanks. Now that's how we might ask what is the time, but the question is, how does a computer ask what is the time? Well, if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Okay, so most computers have clocks and everything from the clock widget on your desktop, meeting reminders, posts on social media, online shopping, they all use the time. Now, many devices have a battery backed real time clock, RTC, like your PC, for example. But some devices don't. For example, the Raspberry Pi does not come with battery backed uh, real time clock. Smartphones rely, of course, on the main battery to have enough power. And even when your phone shuts down, there's often still enough power to keep the clock uh, uh, going. But in all cases, all of these devices need to check they have the correct time and synchronize it to make sure it is accurate. Now, computer clocks tend to drift because they're not really a very expensive part in the whole kind of sum of everything. And so, for example, I switched off synchronization on a desktop PC and on a Raspberry Pi, and they both started to lose about 0.1 seconds per day, which means after a couple of weeks, they'll be about two seconds uh, out. Now, I have a PC that I use that's not connected to the internet at all. It's in an audio visual setup that I have to use. And during the course of the year, that clock can be wrong by several minutes. So it's very important that computers synchronize their time to actually get the correct date and time uh, for all the things that we do, the simple things we do like emails and uh, buying things online. But there are some computers that need very, very high computer accuracy for time. So, for example, financial transactions in a stock market, you know, fractions of a second, who got that buy order or that sell order in first becomes important. The same with telecommunications, power distribution, factory automation, all of these areas need sub one second. They need very good um, kind of, you know, accuracy for the clocks. Research labs, you're doing particle, you know, physics uh, research, then you, it's even better, you need even greater definitions, accuracy of time. Data centers need accurate time. Distributed databases particularly need uh, accurate time. So it's not only for the stuff that we do, simple things like social media or buying, you know, a, a, a new packet of uh, tissues online. You act, There are some areas where really, really high accuracy is important for, for the jobs that the people are doing. This is no time to argue about time. We don't have the time. Now, how do any of us know what is the time? Now, without getting philosophical or metaphysical, we need a reliable time source. Now, that's not going to be the watch on your wrist. It's not going to be the uh, kind of the clock on your kitchen wall. OK, we need a gold standard. And at the moment, that's generally Global Navigation Satellite Systems, GNSS, which includes GPS, uh, GLONASS, Galileo, and there are there are several others. Of course, there are also atomic clocks and radio clocks, and these also offer high precision timekeeping. Now, these level of, you know, atomic clock kind of things, of course, GPS satellites, and they've got atomic clocks in them. Atomic clocks are generally called stratum zero devices, and they broadcast the time. Of course, that's the whole way that global uh, navigation satellites work. They broadcast the time, and you can work out your, your position based on the time. Now, servers somewhere will synchronize with a stratum zero device, and they will offer synchronization services over a network. And they're called stratum one devices or primary time servers. So there are lots and lots of these primary time servers dotted around all around the world. And then you can actually have further servers that are further connected to them. So what you actually get then is this layer approach, stratum. So stratum zero is the satellites, stratum one, maybe these primary time servers who's kind of connected up to all these, maybe connected up to a radio clock, to an atomic clock, and they really know the time. And then you get these servers that are connected to them directly, and then other servers would connect to them. And you can actually get up to 15 layers of uh, stratum. It, once you get to the 15th layer, you, you're not allowed to take the time from the 15th layer one because that is the bottom layer, but from 14 upwards. But generally, we get one, two, three, maybe four kind of knocking about uh, on the internet. Now, the most common system for synchronizing clocks on servers, PCs, laptops, smartphones, tablets, smart TVs, etc., is NTP, the Network Time Protocol. Now, NTP is one of the oldest internet protocols that's currently being used. It was designed by David Mills of the University of Delaware in the 1980s. 
Now, typically an NTP client polls one or more NTP servers and requests the current time, the correct time. And accuracy is normally measured in tens of milliseconds. So you know that the, uh, the clock on your PC is uh, accurate within 50 milliseconds, 80 milliseconds. And of course, if you have, don't have a grasp of milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds, we're gonna talk about them. But I do have a whole video about this, which I recommend you check out. Now there's another uh, approach to doing uh, time synchronization called the Precision Time Protocol, PTP. Now it uses special hardware to create timestamps, so it doesn't use it through the software, actually does it at the kind of at the network level down by the network card, and it's able to get a much more accurate timing of how these packets fly about on the on the network. And what happens in PTP, it's a bit different to NTP, there's one node which is designated to be the Grand Master in any particular NetUp network setup. And the Grand Master assumes a leader role and it sends out synchronization messages to its followers. So rather than the NTP client asking for the time, with uh, PTP the Grand Master sort of sends out the time. There are still some other messages that go back and forth trying to measure delay and we'll talk about that in a minute. Now accuracy with PTP is less than one microsecond, so therefore it's measured in nanoseconds. Now the White Rabbit Network by CERN uses PTP for sub nanosecond accuracy and picosecond precision of synchronization over distances that you measure in kilometers. So that's a really, really precise use of this technology. So how does it work? Well, we're going to use NTP as an example, but the concepts about delays and things which we'll talk about in a minute are the same for PTP, uh, but we'll just use NTP. So a client sends a request to the time server, the time server receives the request, processes it and sends back a reply, and then the client receives the reply. Basically, what time is it? Uh, it's uh, 10, 30 and 21 seconds, and that's basically what happens. So uh, the client asks for the time and the server gives it back the correct time. But, but, what about the network delays? It takes time for the request to reach the server, particularly if you're doing it over the internet, so it's gonna go down through your local network, over your Wi-Fi even, out through the, uh, the you know, the, the modem or the router that you've got from your, your network provider, that goes out onto the internet, might go across a couple of countries, it might hit the uh, type primary time server, and then it has to process that, and it's getting in lots of other requests as well, your request gets processed and then it has to send it back. It goes over a couple of countries, goes through into your local internet provider. Finally, it comes all the way over your Wi-Fi and gets back to your smartphone or to your laptop. And it can say, oh, great, I know what the time is now. And also, what happens if the time on your client is wrong? So, you know, it's it's a few minutes out. So the time it gets back and the time that it's sent, they're different. So how can it know how long that took if it's trying to calculate the delay? Well, these are all very good questions. And thankfully, there is some very good answers. OK, so the time that the client uh, sends its request, we'll call T0. That's according to the time that the client understands. Now, it could be the wrong time, but the time it knows is the uh, correct time. It sends the request. By time that then gets to the server, it's uh, noted down as T1, the time the request was received. The server then processes it. It then sends back its reply. The time it sends back its reply is known as T2. It's probably the time it's also sending back. And then finally, when it re received again at the other end, that's T3, the time the reply was received. So as we said, T1 is the time it was uh, sent, T1 received, T2, the reply is sent, T3. Now here are the maths. The offset, okay, is T1 minus T0. So that's this one, the time. The timestamp was received minus when it was sent, plus T2 minus T3, all divided by two. And if you, if it's the other way around, that one time is ahead of the other and you get minus numbers, you just take the absolute value. And you can also work out the round trip delay, T3 minus T0, so T3 minus T0, T2 minus T1, and that will give you these two numbers, offset and round trip delay. Well, that's all very well just looking at the, the mathematic symbols here, but let's actually go through a working example and you can actually see that it does actually work out really quite neatly. So here's our algorithm at the top, just so we remember those maths. Now, let's say it's 17.01 exactly on the client, but that time is wrong. 
actual time is 17.01 and 30 seconds. So it's 30 seconds out. And on the server, our primary uh, time server, that's the correct time. So T0 is at 1701, the wrong time, and it gets sent through to the server. Now let's say it takes two seconds to get to the server. We're just using big, nice round numbers here. So T1 is 1701 and 32. Notice now we've gone from 00 to 32. Why? Because the actual real time, of course, is 1701 and 32, because it's 30 seconds wrong. So T1 is 1701, 32. It takes a second, let's say, to process that request, and then a reply is sent at 1701.33. So 30 seconds different from the client, and now three seconds have gone past. So here's our real time, 17.133. And then finally, that goes all the way over the internet, and it gets to our client, T3, when it's 17.01.05 now. It's not 35, because it's got the wrong time, of course. So it's five seconds. So from when it sent off the request, when it got a reply, let's say it took five seconds, and it's got back a reply saying the time is 17.01.33. So, okay, so it knows its time is wrong, but it, actually that's not the time, because at the moment when it gets there, it's actually 17.35, so it would be a two second wrong. Even if it fixed the 30 second delay, it would still be wrong. But if we do the maths as we looked at, so 32, so what's that? T1 minus T0, T1 minus T0, well that's 32 seconds, that's what we've got in there. Plus 28, what's that? T2 minus T3, T2 minus 3, T3 is 28 seconds. Okay, divided by 2 is equal to 30 seconds. So there's a 30 second difference between the clock on the client on the server. Yes, that's correct. We know that. Brilliant. What about the delay? Well, the delay was T3 minus T0, so 05 minus, that's 5 seconds, minus T2 minus T1 is 1 second. So that's 4 seconds for the trip there and back, which is 2 seconds for the round for a one part of the trip. So at T3 here, when the, the client receives the reply, it can set the correct time to whatever was T2 plus the one-way delay, which is two seconds. So it sets it to 1701.35, which is correct. Hooray! Or it could take its own time, T3, 1701.05, plus that 30 seconds that we calculated. So it becomes 2101.35. And that's it. So there you can see a simple example by the fact that the client and the server are both able to uh, put in these protocols, their timestamps, then actually we're able to work out a fairly accurate uh, time for the client. And here's an example uh, on a Linux machine actually showing you it synchronizing with some primary time servers. So you can see some here, uh, Europe and internationally. And those are the name, the domain names of the devices that it's actually syncing to. As you can see, some of them are Stratum 2. There's one there that's a Stratum 3. OK, so we can get these different levels of a uh, time server and we go away and talk to them. Obviously, you'd, you'd think stretch them to be better. But as you can see here at this end one, actually, there's less of a delay. And that's probably because of maybe its physical location. But you can see that generally 50, 30, 80, there's around between 30 and 80 milliseconds a difference between the actual correct time and the time that the um, machine is able to set for itself. Okay, so there you have it. That's how the computer asks for the time. We looked at all the algorithms for asking over the internet, seeing the delays and how that gets calculated. Uh, PTP and NTP use a very similar system for working out the delays. PTP is more precise. And this is another video in my series about time. There's more videos coming, so do stick around for those. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.